All right, thank you very much, Glenn. Uh, my name is Matthew Chekai. I uh, work as the uh, program associate for Europe and Eurasia here at Jamestown. And it is my uh, pleasure to be able to welcome uh, Tomasz Stempien. He's the CEO of uh, Gas System in Poland. And uh, he will say a few words about um, the northern uh, gate, including the Baltic uh, pipeline project, the uh, LNG facility in Świnoujście, and try to put it in a broader perspective. Uh, you know, give basically uh, Poland's point of view as to, uh, again, the future of Baltic energy security. So please, take it away, sir. <clears throat> Thank you, Matt. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. It is a pleasure to be here, to be in the United States, to be in such company. Uh, I represent, as Matthew said, uh, gas system. Gas system is a Polish one and only uh, transmission company, transmission in terms of high pressure pipelines in Poland and also the owner of the LNG uh, terminal, one and only onshore terminal LNG uh, in Central Europe. Uh, my main task is actually to build everything what Mr. Naimski said in, the, in his panel and build it on time. So uh, we've got, uh, I, I as a CEO, and forgive me for that, I will uh, provide you with some numbers numbers uh, in miles, numbers in dollars, and number, numbers in cubic feet. Oh, we missed the colors here. OK. So uh, what we are doing uh, as a transmission company in Poland? Uh, we are doing a lot of investments now, actually, uh, because uh, since, I think, 1989, let's say, there were no significant investments in the gas sector uh, in Central Europe, in Poland. And uh, this resulted in a one-way oriented uh, transmission uh, system oriented from, to pump the gas from east to west. So uh, since uh, 2006, I should say, we started a huge investment program. And uh, till now, we spent $2 billion uh, uh, to invest in building uh, pipelines uh, uh, and LNG terminal in Poland. We managed to build uh, 750 uh, miles of high pressure pipelines and, and uh, 5 uh, billion cubic meters uh, ter terminal, which corresponds to uh, 180 billion cubic feet per year of capacity. Uh, but we are in the middle of this investment program. We invest more money in the system. And uh, before us is the program on which we keen to spend four additional $4 billion uh, uh, to enhance the infrastructure of gas infrastructure in Poland, uh, adding another uh, miles of pipelines, above uh, 1,000 miles of new pipelines and uh, expanding the capacity of LNG terminal in Świnoujście by 50%. So this map shows us all investments which are facing off. Uh, Polish gas market now is about 640 billion cubic feet per year. Uh, we should ask, is it a big number or not big number? Uh, tomorrow morning, I checked that uh, District of Columbia uses 30 billion cubic feet, so 20 times less than Poland. But Poland uses uh, gas in the amount equal to 30% of California use. So it's quite a lot, of, uh, uh, qu quite a, a nice market from gas, and still growing. Uh, Main usage of gas in Poland comes to the residential and commercial and uh, the chemi chemistry industry, not to the power generation. It is also important because I know that in the United States there is uh, a lot of amount of gas used in the power generation sector. In Poland, uh, we have no power generation based on gas, significant. Uh, so, why we are doing it? 
Uh, I'm in the actually hard position because almost uh, uh, was said uh, when we see the context, broader context of the what we are doing and why we are doing it. But I uh, should remember. Uh, you, one of the crises, uh, of gas crises, it was uh, 2006, and it was the, actually it was the, uh, the end of 2005, a beginning of 2006. So it was the eve of the new year, and it was the very hard winter in Poland then, uh, in, the, in, in that part of Europe, it was a hard winter, it comes once uh, 10 years, uh, uh, such a winters, and Imagine that in the, we hit the records of demand for gas each day, and then suddenly uh, the pressure on the bo uh, Polish uh, eastern border uh, suddenly dropped. So it was the really crisis because a gas system as a company which uh, also are re is responsible for managing such crises, we were forced to reduce artificially, reduce the uh, gas flows to the market uh, we practically stopped the gas flows to the industry, uh, including the uh, industry of uh, very importance of national security. This was necessity. Uh, and thanks to our underground gas storages, we've managed to go through this crisis, but we've missed to deliver our contractual obligations. We've missed to deliver uh, 4 million cubic feet during 10 days. So it was, from the economic point of view, very, very, Hard. But such a crisis has occurred several times. Uh, 2009, uh, this crisis influences more countries than Poland because it influences Italy, influences Balkans, uh, and other, other countries. And this is uh, such a winter correlation <laughs> that all, practically most of gas crises happen in the winter. So that that why we are thinking about the security and diversification in terms of to not happen again such a situation. A few words about the re regional uh, perspective. Uh, natural gas market in the Central Europe is uh, slightly growing up. So uh, uh, in opposite of uh, Western Europe, that there is a slightly decline of uh, demand for gas. In, uh, in that region, uh, there is a slightly growing uh, uh, demand for gas, except, except of Ukraine, it was said before. Uh, what is also characteristic, what was also characteristic till, let's say, beginning of this century, that this, these countries, uh, uh, this gas uh, system, gas transmission system built in that countries, it was built uh, in 70s, last century, 20th century, and uh, they were designed to take the gas from the Yamo Peninsula to themselves. There were practically no connections between that countries, or no significant connections between that countries uh, uh, in, in Central uh, Europe. <clears throat> so the countries uh, suffered dependence on the uh, one field of uh, production, because it ga gas comes from the uh, one field from uh, Yamal Peninsula, suffers dependence on one route of transmission. It was a uh, route connecting to this ya uh, Yamal uh, field, and suffer also from the, it was actually this, this uh, supplies were under one long-term contract. So dependence was on three levels. Uh, in terms of field of production, transmission route to the, the, to the markets and one contract with the monopoly, uh, with the monopoly uh, company. And that is why the, the si situation has changed a little bit. As I said, Poland uh, managed to build a LNG terminal and some pipes. Lithuania managed to uh, buy and, and build the FSR use uh, unit, with, which means the, they buy the floating storage uh, regasification unit in Kuipeda. We started to talk with the neighboring countries to build the interconnections. There is already built in between the Hungary and Slovakia. 
uh, I, uh, th there is an interconnector starting to construct, as Mr. Naimski said in his speech, uh, between Finland and Estonia. And there is an uh, uh, enhancement of connection between Estonia and Latvia, Latvia and Lithuania. There is a project between Lithuania and Poland. I will speak later in my presentation. So what, what was the idea, what was the concept, and how it uh, evolved? Now we call it a Northern Gateway Project, which means that we would like to have the direct connection to other uh, area of production. We, have, uh, uh, we would like to have uh, the new route for transmitting this gas, uh, and we would like to give to the market the option to buy this gas from anywhere and from anybody who has this gas, gas uh, else in the world. So Northern Gateway project in the supply side, uh, it means two, uh, two projects. First is uh, LNG coming to Poland through Baltic uh, Sea. Uh, and second, which is the subject of my presentation and will provide you more deta details in it, is the so-called Baltic Pipe project to connect through Denmark uh, Polish gas grid with the Norwegian continental shelf. This Northern Gateway project, when we are talking about the capacity, for example, uh, should correspond when we uh, finish it to the whole Polish market in 2022. Nowadays, uh, one third of Polish gas consumption is covered by the domestic production. Market is still growing, so we'd like to have the enough capacity from both uh, projects to fulfill all uh, uh, Polish demand for gas in five years from now. So, what we've got? We've got the LNG terminal. This is the scheme of this terminal. Uh, we've got the jetty in the harbor to allow us to reload the biggest uh, ships of LNG in the world, actually. Uh, we've got two storage tanks and we've got the uh, regasification area. What we are going to do, these are some pictures that it is real. <laughs> We'd like to expand the capacity by 50% and to manage to do it, we need to build another jetty for smaller units. We need to add the third storage tank. We've got the place uh, for it because design, uh, the terminal was designed to such a capacity. In the future, we, we need to add another Riga's area, uh, Riga's components uh, to make it uh, more effective. Uh, all these projects should end in 2022 as a date of expiring the long-term contract with Gazprom to Poland. And now we come up to the Baltic Pipe project. Uh, we start talks with our friends from Denmark in early uh, 2016, actually, as appointed to the CEO in the beginning, in January, and we started talks with Denmark. We started talks with other neighboring uh, uh, countries about uh, what we are doing. Uh, and in the beginning, we have uh, a big trouble to convince them that this is serious. Uh, it was hard also because there was a once, not once, uh, several times, uh, attempts to uh, build such a direct connection in Poland. It didn't happen uh, in 30 years after transformation. Still doesn't exist. But uh, we are on the good way. Uh, the project has strong support from the European Commission. Uh, it has the status, uh, so-called the project of common interest. It means that the project is not only between the Denmark and Poland through Norway, but it also uh, is in interest in the European Commission view 
in, in interest of whole European Union. We've got co-financing now uh, with the designing phase of the project, so we obtain some money uh, for it. But the Baltic pipe project is not only the subsea pipeline. It is more than that. Uh, Baltic pipe project has to, to enable uh, Polish uh, consumers to buy the gas from the Norwegian continental shelf, we should uh, build, should set five components of this project, which we, we all uh, call the Baltic pipe. Two of them uh, is for only responsible for the Denma Danish company, Energinet, and two of it, starting in the eastern coast of uh, Denmark, is uh, under responsibility of gas system. One in the middle, which is compressor station, uh, we share costs because the compressor station is designed only to pump the gas to Poland. Uh, so we share costs with the Energinet, but Energinet is uh, under responsibility to build it. So what is Denmark need to do is to make a tie-in and build a tie-in to the uh, uh, Norwegian pipeline, Europipe 2. Uh, pipeline which is under operation of Gasco, Norwegian company, which uh, operates all the uh, subsea pipelines in Norway. Uh, to build the subsea pipeline to the uh, western coast of Denmark, to enlarge the, all the Denmark's uh, gas uh, grid, uh, which means to build another three high pressure pipelines in that system. And the gas system, my company, uh, needs to build a subsea pipeline in the, under the uh, Baltic pipe uh, sea and enlarge the Polish gas grid, which I describe in the second and third slide of my presentation. Some numbers. This route is about 600 miles, I suppose. It's 900 kilometers, more or less. Uh, we go through the Dan Danish, Swedish, and Polish waters. We, uh, the pipeline will work in both the directions, so it will be possible for Denmark to get the gas from Poland, for example, for LNG, because all our interconnectors are designed for both bide bidirectional flows. Uh, Baltic pipes brings uh, 360 billion cubic feet per year as a capacity, it would correspond to 50% of Polish gas demand in 2022. As I said, we've obtained some money, six, $60 million uh, dollars for the uh, design phase for it. Uh, and of course, the pipe will be uh, working at least 50 years. What are the arguments on the European level, on the Danish and Polish level? Uh, I think that there were a uh, lot of explanation during uh, this uh, today's uh, conference. I will not uh, uh, go there, so I missed it. About the schedule of the project, where we are now. So as I, as I said, in, we start talks in uh, 2016, but then we signed the framework agreement with Energinet and the project speed up. So we are now, uh, after the mm, signing the transmission uh, agreements uh, with the market, so we got the agreements for 50, 15 years from now to fulfill the, the pipe with the gas, so it's a marketable project. Uh, we, in August, so it is year, uh, above a year uh, ago, uh, we signed the contract with the design company to, uh, actually we've signed all the design uh, uh, contracts uh, to design all this grid and also the subsea pipeline. Uh, we are now in the phase of, we just managed to collect the surveys, to get geotechnical, technical surveys. We started collect the environmental uh, uh, surveys uh, it will last also in the next year because it's the longest uh, um, surveys in the project. Uh, but still, we start to design the pipe. We 
choose the preferred routing. Uh, and uh, in the next year, we're supposed to submit the EIA uh, report and to get the uh, all necessary uh, permissions, including the uh, construction permission on, uh, under the Baltic uh, uh, Sea Pipeline, uh, which we assume to have in uh, spring 2020. And then we will have two years to construct the pipe, uh, to construct the pipe uh, from Denmark to Poland, and start operational in October 2022. On the, let's say, business level, uh, we are now in the very final of negotiating the last agreement with Energinet, so-called construction agreement. For us, it's a final investment decision. We are at the day of signing such a contract. I think that in December, uh, late November, we'll have this agreement. So it will be the point of no return from the, from the project. So, Amongst all, uh, all Polish attempts to connect to Norwegian continental shelf, our project, I think, it's m more mature now. So it's real. This is one side, supply side, of the old conception. We got also the demand side uh, of the uh, Northern Gateway. And it was, of course, mentioned in uh, Mr. Naimiski keynote, so I follow it. Uh, okay. We got the project with the Ukrainians. It's in the design phase, but without uh, final decision. We got, the, we got talks with the Czech, uh, Czech company, uh, the company acting uh, in Czechia, actually, because it's not the Czech company. Uh, it does not, it, not belong to, to the Czech government. It's, it's, uh, it's a, a more uh, German company. Uh, we got all permissions to build, but we have no decision from the Czech side. Uh, we are under the final decision, and actually we started to construct the uh, pipe to Slovakia. Uh, and we, of course, are on, uh, after the final investment decision to build uh, the pipe to Lithuania. So uh, on each border, practically, we got the project to uh, give the option from other neighboring countries to uh, get to the gas which we have from the LNG terminal and the Baltic pipe. Okay, I skip this slide about this project. Gas directive was uh, perfectly uh, described by Vladimir Sokol in the first uh, panel, so I <laughs> skip it also. Uh, this uh, tries to uh, um, make some regulations uh, to uh, take the offshore pipelines under the third package from the European legislation. And to sum up, uh, all this investment, so we put a real money, uh, we've got the schedule, we've got the investment decisions. Uh, we are doing it to have the more secure supplies at the first point. Uh, but in the second, uh, which we should also remember, uh, we will have the competitive prices in Poland and in the region. Poland pays more or less three, between three or four billion dollars for gas importing uh, from the east. Uh, it depends on the oil prices, of course, because it's indexed into the oil price. Uh, and all our investments cost three, four billion dollars. So uh, uh, we expect to have the competitive prices in Europe uh, after we manage to build all these projects on four or five years from now. So this is, this is the, the case. This is the main task for us. And uh, last thing, maybe it's good to finish with some asking and some recommendations. So I've got also recommendation from the think tanks in the US and 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 uh, for you maybe because of course we ask for uh, support for what we are doing support in the us supporting uh, and before our uh, allies countries because uh, this is the positive answer 
uh, our positive answer to, uh, to the what, what is uh, going on in Europe now between Germany and Russia, for example. And I think that I stop on this. Maybe it will be some questions. So I was asked to give the no more than 10, 15 minutes. So thank you for your attention. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, thank you. I have a quick yep. where, where did you say the financing is coming from? Okay. <laughs> uh, we got three sources of financing. It first of all is our money, so uh, it it came from our revenues, uh, uh, which we have from transmitting the uh, gas uh, through Poland. Second, we've got the financing from the European funds, different sources. Uh, because, as I said, all our projects are of common interest and we've got, uh, uh, I should say, almost one-third of financing covered by the EU funds. And the rest is, of course, comes from the financial institutions, if it is necessary. So we've got all kinds of financing for this project. All right, uh, thank you. Um, Minister Naimski, during his talks, uh, alluded to this idea of there being a race among the energy suppliers of the Baltic region. And uh, he suggested that you know, if Nord Stream 2 is built first, uh, that is, you know, before uh, Northern Gate is uh, built you know, completely, um, there's this uh, threat that uh, the regional countries may not be able to ever escape you know, Russia's gas trap. And uh, I think this idea of there being a tight schedule, of tight timetable for Poland to uh, be able to complete the projects that are on its books uh, is pretty uh, important to, to stress. So I was wondering if you could uh, discuss that a little bit more. Uh, you know, there are several important dates coming up. Uh, Poland's uh, contract with Gazprom is about to expire in a couple of years. Um, Nord Stream is you know, set to be built, I believe, in 2020, 2022. Is that correct? And um, you know, how does you know? Can you discuss a bit more you know, the timetable that Poland is looking at with uh, its projects? You know, to answer these uh, these schedules. Okay, our region, uh, Central European region, uh, we uh, all the countries actually has uh, have a, uh, contract from transit Russian gas and have contract for supplying the Russian gas. Transit. Transit contracts, historical transit contracts, end on uh, the end of uh, 2019. So it will end. There is no uh, other contract for transit Russian gas. Uh, there are also contracts in Poland uh, to supply the, 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 the for gas. At this contract expires on uh, the end of 2022. All our projects. Uh, which we have on our books and which we are doing, and also in 2022. Uh, so we will be prepared to get the gas from other directions without the obligation to sit and negotiate with the companies from Russia. So this is the main task. So our schedule are feasible, of course, because we, uh, some of this pipe we started to construct now, some will be uh, constructed, start to construct next year, so we get the time to do it. Uh, and to give, as I said, our Polish companies, our Polish customers, the option to purchase the gas from different directions. Great, thank you. Um, are there any questions uh, from the audience? Hi, thank you. My name is Jet Thomason from the State Department. Um, I have two questions, please. What are your estimated returns on investment for the LNG expansion as well as the Baltic pipe? And what are the plans for how this Baltic pipe would cross Nord Stream 1 and presumably Nord Stream 2, I, I guess in Swedish waters? Thank you. <coughs> About the return of investments, uh, we are the infrastructure company and we act as a monopoly and uh, we've got the tariffs. So uh, if we count our revenues 
so far, uh, we've got about 6% of revenues from the investment. As an infrastructure company, it's quite uh, high revenue because in Europe we've got 4% maybe, so we got higher. And we would like to keep it, of course, so uh, it, is, it is possible. Uh, the idea for crossing, I think we, the crossing as such is a only technical problem. Uh, Baltic pipe will cross uh, not only the uh, gas pipelines, but will cross also cables, uh, telecom cables, uh, etc. I think that will be plenty of crossings. And we will have the agreement with the owner of the infrastructure standard agreement because there are best practices in that uh, sector and we hope that there will be a business as usual that it will be not political issue but even if uh, there is a uh, procedure to uh, cross the uh, infrastructure without uh, so-called permission from the owner uh, this is under the decision of the uh, governments of the uh, bodies which uh, grant us uh, permissions. Crossing with the uh, uh, Nord Stream 1 and probably Nord Stream 2 will uh, have place in the Danish waters, not Swedish waters. So we will speak with the same people in Denmark to get the permission to cross. Any other questions? Yes. Looking at the presentation, I've noticed that all of the neighboring countries, but one has a link marked in there. Is there currently any links with Germany, if, if I'm not mistaken? Yeah, uh, there are two links with Germany. There are uh, no new links. These are new links. We've got a link. One link is uh, uh, the big link because it is linked with the YAML pipeline, as I said. But the YAML, we are the operator, not the owner of the YAML pipeline. Um, and there are some rules we, uh, uh, we operate the, this pipe. So it is possible to get the gas from the Germany b via YAML pipeline uh, physically when the uh, flow is stopped from the east to west. It is possible, and it happened from time to time. Uh, and there is also another uh, link. Uh, it is existed. It corresponds about to 10% of Polish market of capacity of this pipe. So uh, these are all links. We, of course, uh, are looking for uh, another to expand these links because uh, as we got, we have more LNG or uh, other uh, sources of gas. We, of course, uh, will be serving uh, as a transmission company the capacities to the Germany, of course, if there will be the, the market for that gas in the Germany. It's obvious. <laughs> but we, of course, uh, face the problems from the infrastructure companies from Germany. That they <laughs> Uh, or not, uh, you know, uh, so eager to invest on their sides to, to get more gas, uh, for example, from Poland. So <laughs> this is the case. And, uh, what is the uh, annual capacity of the interconnection between Poland and Germany for gas? Uh, okay. In uh, billion cubic meters, it is uh, one uh, billion and a half, which correspond to 60, about 60 billion cubic feet, this existing one. Yes. Um, so this is a, a great strategy for diversification for Poland, but also for the region, the way you've described it, right? And so could you say a little bit more about how Ukraine fits in? And where, where I am in Istanbul, I get queries all the time from Naftokhaz about, wow, could the Turkish approach toward the Straits change? Might Turkey allow at some point LNG tankers to go through the straits, and Turkey's not budging on that. So um, how, how far, how big could your connection be from Srinoistia south through Poland into Ukraine? How, how big is your thinking? Uh, this interconnector, it, it depends what will be the interest from the Ukrainian side. For, as we 
talk about the scope of investments from our side, everything will be done because uh, we are expanding our uh, system up to the Slovak uh, border, uh, and it is about a mile, namely a mile from the uh, our system ends mile uh, from the uh, Ukrainian border, so it's nothing. Uh, Ukrainians need to invest and build the 100 uh, kilometers of pipe. It is a big project for them. So it depends on them if they make the decision to, uh, to, uh, to start to construct it. Of course, we are helping them. We are doing our best to, to push them to the decision, but it's up to them. Uh, for us, it will be possible to uh, supply the gas and to flow the gas uh, physically to Ukraine uh, even above this 5 BCM, uh, which is uh, now under the table. But it depends on the Ukrainians. And of course, there is now possibility for Naftohaz and other companies acting in Ukraine to buy and transport the gas to, to Ukraine through Poland, because we got connections uh, with the Ukrainian. We got two connections existing, and they are full. One is to Poland, one is to Ukraine. Uh, the, the, uh, that's how it works now. Uh, but it differs from year to year. There, is, there was one year, one year before, that we fulfill all capacity of one of this pipe to, to Ukraine. Now it is maybe 30%. So. It's up to them. So once Poland uh, consumes all it needs to consume, uh, what excess uh, capacities or excess amounts of gas, what volumes are you looking at for uh, exportability? What yeah, uh, how much more gas can you be able, will you be able to export? You know, once. Uh, Poland's consumption uh, is taken to, into account. <coughs> the export-import case is, for my company, is irrelevant because we are constructing the pipelines and give the market the options to lower the cost of purchasing the gas from the economies. And uh, we will have the opportunity to get the gas to fulfill all the demands in Poland via LNG and Baltic pipe project. Our interconnectors, because this market in Lithuania, in Slovakia, in Latvia, these are not big markets. It's a market like one Voivod ship in Poland. So this capacity, uh, export, let's say, capacity, uh, is designed to fulfill also all these markets. But it's up to them what amount of gas they uh, obtain from this direction. I think that in the end of the beginning of, uh, of uh, when we start exploiting these pipelines, the gas will flow from the place where it is cheaper. So this is the case. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, yes, Margarita. Just, just a quick one to clarify. Once the facility is expanded, the regasification facility, and the pipeline is built. All together, what is going to be the capacity? Capacity of all will correspond, I think, between, because it depends of the uh, technology on the terminal, between 640 billion cubic feet per year to even uh, 700. Billion cubic feet, so it is uh, 20 billion cubic meters. <laughs> yeah, it fulfills all Polish demand, as I said, in that time. And we've, yeah, and we got the connection with the Germany. We got the domestic production. We've covered uh, one third of Polish consumption, so there is the spare capacity to export, import, and etc. We create the market, uh, you know, uh, conditions for the region. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, please join me with a round of applause. Okay.
Okay, we're about to uh, change our speakers. out the day with uh, Igor Vasilevsky, the CEO of PERN, is going to be giving his views of Polish energy security. Uh, very interesting background, among which I would point out in his bio is that he has an MBA from uh, University of Illinois, so uh, quite a, has an American education to back him up, and he's also a Chicago Bears fan, right? <laughs> yeah, but it was 20 years ago. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. It's been a long day, and we're very much looking forward to your, your, your insights and observations, uh, and I have a very long list of questions for you, so when you finish. So. Okay. Thank you, Igor. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's, uh, thank you very much for the invitation, and I'm a little nervous because I have now been in States for, I think, 15 years, and I have uh, no such audience to make the presentation after the finish my MBA. And uh, I would like to present Pern. Uh, Pern is the company which is, uh, how to say, supervised by the Minister of Naimski. Uh, to be concrete, the Minister of Naimski is the, how to say, how it was mentioned today, is the man who supervised all Polish TSO. It's mean gas, oil, and electricity. But uh, starting to this presentation, I would like to f say a few remarks openings this presentation. First, Pern, a strategic Polish company operating in the Polish energy sector, is getting prepared to increase oil supply to Poland via marine routes. Second, secondly, the company implements an extensive investment program in logistics and storage. Thirdly, Poland's refineries are diversifying their portfolios and increasing quantities of oil are shipped by maritime routes from non-eastern directions. They are looking for blends that will allow maximization of production to a degree higher than in the case of Russian oil. Poland is being systematically supplied with crude oil from North Sea, Saudi Arabia, and since 2017 also from the US. And then I would like to say a few words about Perm. We are the logistic operator independent from oil refineries, supplying crude oil to f and fuels to entire Poland and Eastern Germany. We have our own, own crude oil pipeline system and large sophisticated crude oil and fuel depots. We also own the total of, it's like some calculation, 22 million barrels, it's about 3.5 million cubic meter, and 11, it was in crude oil, and 11 million barrels uh, in fuel storage capacity. We specialize in the storage of gasoline, diesel oil, light fuel oil, biocomponents, and aviation fuel oil for direct supply to the market as well as for maintaining mandatory so stocks. Our company is also managing a sophisticated crude oil sea terminal on the Baltic Sea, which accepts raw materials from all over the world. The handling capacity this terminal is approximately 800,000 barrels per day for crude oil and 80,000 barrels per day for petroleum products. Our role is to ensure interrupted oil and fuel supplies to Poland. Poland is technica technically connected to the Russian system. We supply four refineries, two in Poland, two in Germany, and we provide commercial storage services. Okay, next slide, please. The entire imports and export of crude oil in Poland and most imported petrochemicals are transferred to our infrastructure. Our company is responsible for coordinating the supply to Poland and East Germany. We cooperate with a number of other companies such as Saudi Aramco, Shell Total, BP, ENI, Rosneft Total, and also Pekan Orlen and Lotus Group. Hopefully, we shall soon strike deals with the clients from the US. We're interested in establishing cooperation in the field of storage and direct contracts of supply of crude oil to one of two Polish refineries which use our services. 
Of course, uh, I'll say a few words about trends in crude oil and fuel markets in Poland. Poland's market is increasingly opening in deliveries from new suppliers. Polish refineries implement global scale investment, allowing the refineries to expand the processing capacities with use the crude grades other than Russian. For this reason, Polish refineries buy increasing quantities of crude oil from different regions of the world. Today, crude oil is supplied to Poland not only from Russia, but also from the North Sea, Saudi Arabia, or the USA. Depending upon the time of crude is delivered to Poland, Pern is prepared to provide flexible transmission of such crude to refineries while maintaining full quality of transmitted material. Pern keeps up with growing demand by developing in its infrastructure. In 2018, crude oil is imported to Polish refineries, mainly from the east, while simultaneously diversifying sources of supply. supply. The share of Repco is the Russian oil, as the supply decreased from 81% in 2016 to 77% in 2017. The diversification of supply falls with the strategic interest of Poland, as it is essential to the energy independence and security of our country. Diversification is also a consequence of falling quality of Russian crude transmitted along the Western Road. It is a consequence of Russian reorientation to cooperation with China in the area of energy supply. In 2017, Poland received first deliveries of American crude oil. Last year, these deliveries accounted for 5% of non-Russian raw material imported by maritime roads. As at the end of August this year, 2018, this share increased to over 15%. Coming to the products. In the year 2016-2017, as well in the first half of 2018, fuel market indicated strong growth in the result of promulgation of the government of the, Pub of the Republic of Poland of new legislation in the form of fuel, energy, and transport package. The regulation referred to above stop illegal supply to liquid fuel to Poland. The regulation provides advantages, solutions to the state, national energy security, and final users. Following the implementation of new regulation, our company noted considerable growth in demand for the services provided. Person want to increase market demand for storage capacities. New investment will be necessary in this area. Pern has at its disposal adequate capacities to accept increased fuel flows. Pern also makes the investment necessary to prepare to handle increased demand. And coming to this, uh, Details. In view of market trends and challenge of the power sector is currently facing, the government of Republic of Poland undertakes consistent efforts to order this market. By the end of last year, the government presented a new policy for logistics in the oil sector. The program includes a number of investment projects to be implemented by PERN in coming years. We already commenced the planning works on a second crude oil pipeline from the terminal on the Baltic Sea to central Poland. The, oil, the crude oil pipeline will be 150 miles long with the diameter of 30 inches and through of 500,000 barrels per day. The new pipeline will allow better diversification and full quality based separation of new crude grades from our clients. For our currently expanding our fuel depots, we intend to build seven new oil tanks at the terminal in Gdansk and also in our depot in Gdansk. In total, the storage capacity will increase by nearly 3.7 million barrels to the level of 25 million barrels. The construction of new crude oil tanks in Gdansk depot has already started. The facility will be extended along the Baltic Sea coast in the vicinity of the crude oil supply sidebar maritime roads. The project indicates the director directions of changes in the logistic and storage system in place in Poland. Effective legislation, what I said before, 
uh, undertaken by the government of Poland resulted in stop illegal trade in fuel, resulting also in rapid growth in the demand for new storage capacities. In the fuel sector, Pern builds new tanks with the total capacity over 1.8 million barrels to the overall level of 13 million barrels. It's about 2.1 million cubic meter. And coming to the end, I would like to underline that Pern is a large, is a large independent Polish logistic company cooperated with the global scale companies all over the world. We own sophisticated handling and storage depots, standards like pipelines, own harbor, and the capacity to handle tankers of the Baltic Sea. We are also a self-financing commercial company of strategic importance to Poland. We are entering the American market with the offer to cooperate in the number of fields with American experts from the oil industry. We what we can offer, we can offer strong experts in the field of oil supply from the US, which we intend, intend to further development. I think what we could, how to summarize the, the day, when we listen to this uh, speeches and presentation about the gas sector and the oil, I think the infra infrastructure is a, key, is a key, but the key challenge is to build it faster than others. Thank you very much, and I would like to give the floor Glenn Howard, because he started the conference and it's the time to finish it. <laughs> Thanks. I think the one thing that this conference today is uh, really, it's, it's you've had so many different arrays of opinions and views is that, you know, Poland remains a very important strategically the United States and it's important for us uh, to continue to, to think about the ways that we, the United States can help Poland uh, in, in this time of energy diversification. And, and I think that um, one thing that Poland has never had a, a, an absence or lack of strategic thinkers. Uh, and I think throughout its history, and I can say that as someone who used to work for Dr. Zbigniew Brzezinski, I could say that Poles always have vision and always have a strategic objective. And I think that it's very important for the United States now to try to help Poland uh, carry on some of these, uh, I, uh, these very innovative ideas and in trying to diversify and trying to deal with this difficult time. And I think uh, Mr. Naimski's comment today that, that, that was very interesting that I found was that, you know, not to think of the Baltic as a sea, but as a gulf. And I, and I, I think strategically kind of envisioning that, especially looking at all the charts, and all the, the different maps uh, of, of the Danish Straits, uh, uh, it is very strategic and very difficult. And I think that, it, that this is, um, I think it's important uh, in this day and age of Americans to understand the basic strategic geography of Eastern Europe. And, and I think that we're kind of losing that. And uh, I'm very happy that, the, that we've been able to have two, you know, CEOs of two very important companies here uh, as well as Mr. Naimski, and I thank them for taking the time day to be able to to highlight some of these issues and problems. And in, in the first panels that we had, very much, I think, accomplished the goals of what we set out today. Um, and I think whenever you think of Jamestown, you don't think of opinion, but you think of informed uh, analysis uh, based on facts and data. And that's what we're, we're known for, and you've heard a lot of that today. I think uh, we're uh, if anyone has any, does, any pressing questions, I, I'm going to close today's discussion and thank our guests and, and thank, thank you very much for coming. Uh, it's been our great privilege and wish everyone safe travels home. Thank you. Thank you.